Turn your Bibles to Matthew chapter 26. That's where we're going to be this morning, and we need to get right into it because, like I said, we're running a little bit behind. So as you're opening up in your Bibles to Matthew 26, be aware that we're talking about the title, the first and the last, coming from our context this morning. Here's the context. If you're looking at the screen, it's a lot. But you remember, this is just the last 24 hours of Jesus' life. From nightfall on Thursday night, through to the cross the next morning, these are the scenes in the life of Christ, scene by scene. So on his way out is Jesus in the upper room, and we were remembering that he wanted us to rejoice in his sacrifice, right? Singing Psalm 118, they sang a hymn and then went out. And Jesus, on the way out to the Garden of Gethsemane, is discipling his men all the way to the end. John 14, John 15, John 16, John 17, And on his way into the garden, we learned and watched him pray in his suffering, right? About the cup that he would drink down to the bottom of God's wrath. And then on the way up with his arrest, we saw Jesus' power. Power over his betrayer. Power over his disciples in that moment. Power over even his captors. And then last Lord's Day, we saw him in the courtroom back up in the city at Caiaphas' house hearing the confessions of both Caiaphas and Jesus in the second Jewish trial. We just kind of acknowledged the first Jewish trial in John chapter 18 and then spent time in Matthew 26, where Matthew places emphasis on the second Jewish trial and the control Jesus has over the false accuser's lies, the control he has even as he doesn't give a response in his silence, the control he has with his confession of who he is as the son of man who will be seated at the right hand of power and then coming again on the clouds and then his control over the highest injustice imaginable, condemning the son of God and then speaking against him, spitting upon him and striking him in the face. And we saw last Sunday that Jesus is in control of the most unjust day of his life so that we can Trust that he is in control of the most unjust days of our life. What a timely text last Sunday's was in light of what was happening in our church. But today we're turning to the bottom, which is in the courtyard, and learning from Peter's denial. So we're shifting characters today from Jesus to Peter. Follow along with me in God's word in verse 69. Now, Peter was sitting outside in the courtyard, and a servant girl came up to him and said, You also were with Jesus the Galilean. But he denied it before them all, saying, I do not know what you mean. And when he went out to the entrance, another servant girl saw him, and she said to the bystanders, This man was with Jesus of Nazareth. And again he denied it with an oath. I do not know the man. After a little while, the bystanders came up and said to Peter, certainly you too are one of them, for your accent betrays you. Then he began to invoke a curse on himself and to swear, I do not know the man. And immediately the rooster crowed. And Peter remembered the saying of Jesus, before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. And he went out and wept bitterly. So we want to learn today to see our weakness in Peter's weakness so that we can feebly turn back to Jesus. Feebly turn back to Jesus in light of the weakness that we see with Peter that is ours. Now, context is going to be really helpful here to to get clarity about what's happening in this particular scene. And the context is is that the passages around this one, okay? So so let's start there. It's helpful for Matthew to to see us kind of walk through this chronologically. That's what he's doing now. But he's also walking us through the life of Christ spiritually at the same time. I don't know if you've noticed, but there's three characters in a row in this passage. There's Jesus and what's going on in the courtroom. There's Peter and what's happening in the courtyard. And then there's another man too, who is who after this passage? Judas, Judas. So there's three main characters. The Lord is on trial. 
Today we're going to see the first disciple, Peter, on trial. And then next Sunday, Lord willing, we'll see the last disciple in his trial too, Judas. So there's Jesus' declaration first, there's Peter's denial second, and then there's Judas's demise third. You got it? That's the context. And we're right in the middle of those three characters. And context with the characters gives clarity because the first one falls, that's Peter, and the last one falls differently. This Sunday is much more of a call to the Christian. Next Sunday is much more of a call to the non-Christian who thinks they're a Christian. Let's begin with the prologue, though. The prologue is in verse 69, and that's at the very beginning of our passage. So now we're not talking about context. Now we're into our own text, and we're looking at how Matthew's setting the scene. He sets it really briefly, doesn't he? But it's worth kind of camping on. Peter is sitting outside in the courtyard. So the setting of the scene is important like the setting of the context. How? Well, let me ask you a question. How did Peter get access into the high priest's courtyard in the middle of the night? I mean, I don't know about you, but like, I don't, I don't think that Peter should just be allowed to walk into the courtyard of the high priest in the middle of the night. This would be like, for example, you being let onto the White House lawn in the middle of the night, climbing that big, like that big massive iron gate that surrounds the front yard of the president, and you get let into that in the middle of the night. You would think that that's pretty elite access, don't you think? But this is more elite access than that. This, this actually here would be like you being let in, not to the front lawn of the president, but being led on to the, the north portico of the White House, the front porch of the president. If you know the White House, you know what I'm talking about. It's not the circular side of the White House. It's the front side of the White House, and that is the, called the north portico. Can you imagine getting access to the north portico of the White House in the middle of the night? But this would be more still than that, more elite still than that. This would be akin here in verse 69 to you being let in the front door of the White House and gaining entrance to the entrance hall and sitting down there in the middle of the night. Nobody gets this kind of access ever, much less in the middle of the night. So I'm gonna ask you the question again. How, looking at the setting, how did Peter get access to the courtyard of the high priest, the most powerful man in Israel? Well, turn to John chapter 18. John chapter 18. The setting or the prologue is going to give us an idea that a power play is underway here. Look at John 18, verse 15. Simon Peter followed Jesus, and so did another disciple. What's the disciple's name? Mm -hmm. John. Since that disciple was what? Known to the high priest. He entered with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest, but Peter stood outside the door. So the other disciple, who was known to the high priest went out and spoke to the servant girl who kept watch at the door and brought Peter in. Wow, that's like a, that's a significant part of the prologue in Matthew 26. It's not stated. Matthew doesn't need to state it, but this gives you an idea that when Peter was led in the door of the high priest into the courtyard, he had elite access because he had an elite connection. The apostle John was a super young man at this time. How do you know? How do you know he was so young? Maybe a little bit older than Grace, who was just baptized. How do, you, how do you know? Because John would live into the 90s AD. So this is like 30 or 33 AD, and he's going to live into the 90s, late 90s, maybe as late as 100 AD. 
meaning that here in John 18, Matthew 26, he's exceptionally young, a young man, the youngest of Jesus' disciples, almost certainly. So how does he know the high priest, Caiaphas, the most powerful man in Israel? And by the way, the most powerful high priest since the exilic period, hundreds of years before. Well, probably it's not because of John. It's probably because of John's dad. Who's John's dad? Old Zebedee. Are there, is there anybody? We've got a lot of families in our church that name their children after biblical characters. Have you noticed? Is there any parent out here who would want to step up to the plate and say, I'm going to name my child Zebs? Step up there and do it. Zebedee, he was really well connected. He actually knew the high priest almost certainly which I want to tell you is because he was a fisherman in Galilee. Now, there are some people who would say all the disciples were ordinary men. They're just plain dudes, nobody special, nobody powerful, nobody of any means. On one level, that's true. On another level, we also know that that might not necessarily be always true. Not many noble, not many mighty, not many wise are called, but some are. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And it seems like Zebedee might have been. He owned a fishing business in Galilee, and the fish that he caught in the first chapter, or first service, I kept saying the fish he captured. I don't know why I kept saying capturing fish. I actually think it's a stronger term, so I like, I'm going to keep using that. So the fish that Zebedee would capture in the Sea of Galilee were considered a delicacy all over the Roman Empire. So they were sold at a huge premium there. It only could be caught there in the Sea of Galilee. In fact, today they're still called St. Peter's fish. They're nasty. But that means that Zebedee was a man of means. And as a man of means, he was connected to the high priest in Jerusalem, Caiaphas. And because of that connection, a young man, John, was able to get Peter into the courtyard. You want to know why? So that he could deny Jesus three times. Let me say it like this. The connection that Zebedee had to Caiaphas to connect those two men meant that John could get Peter into the courtyard so that Peter could fulfill Jesus' prophecy that he had to deny him before the night was through. This is another way. Look at the setting. This is another way that Jesus is dominating the scene on the way to the cross. He set up a connection between Zebedee and Caiaphas years before when John was maybe a lot smaller than he already was to ensure that John could get Peter in the door to fall at just the right time. It's a power play to teach Peter his weakness. Let let me say that again. It's a power play in the prologue. From the first phrase of this text, to teach Peter something in the last phrase of the text. Pay attention to the prologue, because the epilogue is coming. But not before the denials. I mean, this passage is not hard to organize. I just want to walk through it with you. The denial, number one, is to pretend to be dumb. That's what Peter does here in the first denial. Come back to verse 69 now and see that a servant girl, the word is a slave girl, comes up to Peter and says, you also were with Jesus the Galilean. So Peter is sitting down and you're, you're wondering like, why is he sitting down in the courtyard? Like if you could get into the White House, would it occur to you that a good idea would be to like get into the White House and just take a seat. Well, that's what Peter's doing. Why is he sitting down? Well, in Mark's and John's parallel accounts of this moment, Peter is sitting down because he's warming himself around a fire with other bystanders. That's how the bystanders get there. So he's sitting around a fire, and and John says around a charcoal fire, which is going to be important in Peter's restoration in John 21, not relevant for us. The slave girl asks Peter, the question that he asks, or maybe he makes a statement that, he, that she asks in verse 69. And the Bible says in verse 70 that Peter denies it before them all. That's a gut-wrenching term, deny. It's the Greek word arneomai. 
And it means to renounce or disown someone or something. To like disown someone. The only other time the term is used in Matthew is back in Matthew chapter 10. Turn back there to Matthew chapter 10 and look with me at verse 33. This is the little commission in Matthew's gospel. Jesus is sending out his men to do gospel work, mission work, you could say, all over Israel. And so Peter's among them. And Jesus is wrapping up his, his commissioning, his little commission, I call it. The great commission is still coming in chapter 28. But Jesus says, in verse 33, the only other occurrence of the term in the Gospel of Matthew, whoever denies me, arneomai, before men, I will also arneomai before my Father who is in heaven. If you deny me here, I'll deny you there. Your call, your call. Verse 32 is, if you confess me before others, which is what Jesus had just got done doing in the courtroom, then I will confess you, Jesus says, before my Father, in heaven, verse 32, you have two ways to live. You can confess him before men, and he will confess you before the Father, or you can deny Jesus before men, and he will deny you before the Father someday at the judgment seat. There's no middle ground. Second Timothy 2, verse 12, another occurrence of the same term. If we deny him, he will also deny us. 1 John 2, verse 22 and 23, who is the liar, John says, but he who arneomized that Jesus is the Christ. John continues, this is the Antichrist. He who denies the Father and the Son. No one who denies the Son has the Father. I mean, in the strongest possible terms, what Peter is doing here is turning away from Christ such that you have Jesus' promise that he will turn away from Peter unless we're somehow misreading Matthew 10, 33. Specifically in this denial, <clears throat> it's a single servant girl, slave girl, that calls Jesus, did you notice, the Galilean. Did you see that? That, that, that name is, is kind of representing a, a regional snobbery expected of those from the high priest's household in Jerusalem the Jerusalemites would like to look down their nose at people from the north country, the, the, the rural area of Israel. So with Jesus, the Galilean, Peter looks around. I mean, you get a sense of it in verse 70, don't you? He denied it, not, not to her. Look at your Bibles. He denied it as he looked around the fire. And before them all, in kind of pleads a pseudo ignorance. I don't know what you mean. Now, this is like what every politician does when they're confronted with a scandal. They take the mic in a press conference, they're totally exposed, and they say, I don't know what you're talking about. I do not remember. I cannot recall. Matthew calls this kind of pretending to be dumb, denying Christ. And this is helpful. It might be that some of you in the workplace, you know, it's, it's a election year, and people tend to unite politics with religion, especially in the world. And so you'll hear somebody around the water cooler saying to you, I just cannot figure out those knucklehead evangelicals. These people are all crazy. Why, how do they even still exist in our time? And you can be tempted in that moment to say, what's an evangelical? Or, I don't even know what you're talking about. Now, it doesn't mean that you have to own the label evangelical. But you get the sense of what I'm talking about. Inside of us, around the water cooler, we're all kind of a little bit inclined to go like, play dumb, just play dumb and get out. Don't have to own it. But Matthew calls that verse 70 a denial of the Lord. Peter is trying to save his life, which means that he's in danger of what? Whoever would desire to save his life 
will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my name's sake will save it. After this first denial, notice in verse 71, Peter gets up. He gets up and he goes to the door of the courtyard. He, he, he's like kind of slipping out and slipping away spiritually. He's moving farther away from the Lord's presence in the courtroom, in the courtyard. Perhaps he's trying to escape more questions, but that strategy doesn't work. Trying to escape more questions and hope that people won't keep asking you about what you believe is a strategy that usually doesn't work. Because here comes denial number two. Now, a profound lie. Jesus, by the way, meanwhile, is, is advancing toward his enemies. He's taking his stand in the courtroom, and he's saying nothing but the truth about himself. At great cost to his life, Peter is consistently retreating when he's being met with opposition, this time by another slave girl. Jesus, standing before the, the high priest of Israel, Peter shrinking back at the approach of a slave girl. And this is another one, verse 71, apparently, a different one, right? Another servant girl. And I don't know if she even knows that she's upping the ante, but she is upping the ante. In the first denial, the slave girl, you'll notice, addresses Peter in the presence of bystanders. But here in the second denial, she approaches the bystanders in the presence of Peter. Do you see the difference? Look at your Bibles. Another servant girl saw him and she said to the bystanders, now she's, this other girl, rallying all of the, the witnesses and they're all looking at Peter for a response. Ooh, man, this is ratcheting up the drama in denial number two. By the way, another leveling up of pressure on Peter is with what she says. She, she says, this man was with Jesus, what? Of Nazareth. Seriously, this guy follows Jesus. Do you know where he's from? He's from Nazareth. Remember Nathaniel when Jesus called him in John 1? Nathaniel says, Can anything good come from this town? I mean, this would be like the equivalent of somewhere in our country where nobody wants to be from. And then the region or the state. And then inside the region of the state, you pick the lowest of the low city or town in that city or that, that state or region. So in the first service, I'll say it again, second service, is anyone from South Dakota? <laughs> yeah, one person raised their hand. Nobody's from South Dakota, we're good? That'd be like saying like, seriously, um, not just from South Dakota, I can't even think of a town in South Dakota. Not even just from South Dakota, they're from Nazareth, South Dakota. I mean, this is the, the bottom of the bo bottom of the barrel town in the bottom of the barrel region of the country. I mean, this is a new low as a descriptor of Jesus. And it represents leveled up pressure on Peter to respond. And with all eyes on Peter now, and him sensing the need to respond to the bystanders who are watching him, he levels up his denial too in two ways. First, he takes an oath. He takes an oath. And that's something similar to like when we say, I swear I didn't do it. Have you ever heard someone say that? Or I swear I did that. Typically when someone does that, it's because there's a, some kind of pressure they feel to have to justify something that they're not being believed to be true. So they, they say like, I swear I did, I did that or I didn't do that. Interesting, isn't it, that Peter's putting himself under oath when Jesus himself is being put under oath as well? And the one profoundly lies in the courtyard and the other profoundly speaks the truth in the courtroom. By the way, um, in Matthew, only bad dudes take oaths. For example, Herod takes an oath in Matthew 14, verse 7. The, the scribes and the Pharisees take an oath in chapter 23, verses 16 and following. And Caiaphas takes an oath in chapter 26, verse 63. It's never good in Matthew to take an oath. And this is in accordance with the Sermon on the Mount. Stop taking oaths. Stop saying, I swear to you I did it. 
heard a husband say that one time to his wife. I'm like, that's not helping your cause. And in fact, actually, the Greek may suggest something even worse than the oath with how he says what he says when he says in verse 72, I do not know the man. It's, it's curious because the Greek could actually be construed to mean that Peter's not even denying knowing Jesus. He could even be denying knowing the name of Jesus. Look at your Bibles in verse 72. He won't even name Jesus. Meaning, he, maybe he's even swearing that he doesn't even know his name. The guy you're talking about, I don't even know his name. Let me say it like this. With profound enough peer pressure, some of us might be inclined to even not acknowledge the name of Jesus. Now, I just want to speak to students for a second. Students, listen. Listen. You are the ones in life who probably, and, and you know, people who are on social media a bunch do feel a lot of pressure, but if you're a student, you're more inclined to be put under peer pressure. And this is your denial. This is the denial right here. Everybody's looking at you. Here comes you trying to live for the Lord and you get stuck because everyone's being cool and being wicked or evil or whatever. And all the eyes at some point turn to you and it's up to you. Now it's game on. Are you going to stand for Christ in that moment? Or are you going to give him away? Learn from Peter. I mean, there's, there's going to be pressure for you to profoundly lie and say, I don't, I don't, I don't know him. I don't follow him. That's, that's, the, that's the relative lie. I don't follow him. I mean, unless you don't. That's next week's sermon with Judas. But do you see how here, students, there's something for you to consider. The next time this week you get put under pressure to take a stand for Christ, what will it be? What will it be? Can I give you some encouragement, students, when they ask you? Can I give you the answer that Jesus gave? Are you going to take a stand for Christ? Are you going to take the hit? Remember Jesus' words when he was pressured by the whole room. And he said, they said, are you Jesus, the Christ, the son of God? And what did he say? You said so yourself. He took his stand and took a hit. Peter, on the other hand, is an example you should not follow, students. Where he, when asked, do you know this guy? says, I don't even know him. And by the way, I don't even know his name. And by the way, I don't know if you know this. I mean, the second denial is obviously running deeper than the first. Let's look at the screen. But Peter is now at the front door of the courtyard. What's happening inside of his soul spiritually is happening in his life physically. He's now hanging on by a thread to following Jesus. Now, I want you to look back up at verse 58. Peter was following Jesus at a distance, verse 58, as far as the courtyard of the high priest. And going inside, he sat with the guards to see the end, to see Jesus's end. And now, just this many moments later, Peter is hanging on by a thread to following Jesus all the way to the end. Is he going to follow all the way to the end? You know, it's remarkable at this moment in Peter's life. Even his retreat is half-hearted. He just can't make his mind up about what he wants to do with regard to following Jesus. I mean, he, he follows at a distance, verse 58, half-hearted. But he retreats halfway to the door. He's got his hand on the door, hanging on for dear life with his following of Jesus. And some of us are probably like that too. We want it both ways. We, we, we want to exit stage left if the, if the going gets tough. But we also want the privileges of following Jesus when the going's great. When he's doing miracles and when he's feeding people and when he's, you know, raising people from the dead. We're in. We're following Jesus then. But when the going gets tough, we start to head for the door. You can't be a halfway disciple of Jesus. Do you see? 
You can't, you, you, this is what grace said. You either deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow Jesus, if I can just add to her language, to the end, or you deny him. You can either deny yourself, or you can deny him. There's no halfway. You can take up your cross, or you can reject the cross. There's no halfway. You can follow Jesus or you can follow yourself. There's no halfway. Students, this denial is for you, so I'm gonna aim this application at you. Make up your mind about who you're gonna serve. Stop using your teenage years to straddle the fence and be halfway. No, make your commitment now. Don't waste a single year of your life on yourself. Why would you? What a waste of all of the energy that God's given to you, all of the stamina and the, and the vigor that he's given. Use it for him. Get off the fence and live for Christ. Parents, press this home. And if you haven't, you are still watching your child holding the door. Then just wait for Christ to do the work that you can't. Which way will Peter choose? He's at the door. Will he stand or will he fall? You already know which way he's going to go. He's going he's to fall. In a profane way, he's going to burn the ships. I, I, I just want you to know, Peter enjoys a respite, doesn't he? In verse 73, after a little while, the bystanders came up. So he apparently was able to hang out at the door for a little while, probably thinking a lot about what just happened. But eventually, this time he's approached not by a single you know, servant girl, that's denial one, not by another single girl, slave girl with a group. That's denial number two. It's this group of bystanders now in verse 73. We don't know if it's the same bystanders or different. We don't know. But listen, here is the difference here. In, in, in stage three of the denial, they're positive that Peter was a follower of Jesus because of his strong accent. This, this would be akin to someone who's like, you know, I do not know what you mean, y'all. I mean, I'd be like someone saying, like Peter coming back with a strong Southern accent. You're like, dude, this guy clearly was with Jesus because they were all in Georgia together just last week, you know? Or like if, if somebody busted out a SoCal accent, bro, I don't, I don't know what you mean, dude. You know, like that was a strong SoCal accent or someone told me I needed to practice my Manhattan accent and I'm gonna try the New York accent. But do you know what I mean? Like instantly recognizable Peter was instantly recognizable by his accent. And do you not hear Matthew's irony in what they say to Peter? Your accent. What's the word? Look at your Bibles. Your accent betrays you. I mean, Peter is a stone's throw away from not just denying the Lord, but Matthew's like loading language in here that's getting you to, to think about, holy smokes, am I a denier or am I gonna be a betrayer? Am I gonna be Peter or am I gonna be Judas? Your accent betrays you. Did you know one rabbi actually back in this time stated that the Galilean accent was so strong and so disliked by, by rabbis in the South, in Judea, in Jerusalem, that they forbid a Galilean from pronouncing a blessing in the synagogue service. They wouldn't even let a Galilean close in prayer because their accent was so bad. Peter is absolutely trapped at the door. He's been backed into a metaphorical corner now. So what's he going to do? Well, he's gonna, he's gonna do what Peter does best. He's going to go nuclear. Peter swears again this time. You see that there in verse 74, right? He swears. 
But then he also now begins to invoke a curse on himself. He's calling down curses. Now, in some commentaries, people say that he called down a curse on himself, meaning like, I'm, I'm damned to hell if this is true. It's just not true. That sense is fair. You could say that Peter is doing it. The problem with that out is in the Greek, the, word, the, the phrase on himself is not there in verse 74. So did Peter pronounce a curse on himself, as many commentators say, or did he pronounce a curse on Jesus himself? So in the, in the early church period, there was a man named Pliny the Younger. Pliny the Younger was a Roman official. He was writing a letter, a tract, or a tractate, to Emperor Trajan about what to do with this sect of people that were really nettlesome called the Christians. And Pliny had a way to, to find out who they were and force them to turn away from Christianity and turn back to the Roman gods, and specifically the Roman god, Trajan. Along two lines, one, he would have the Christians, when he caught them, be forced to make a statement to confess that Trajan, Caesar, was Lord and God. Confess that positively. And then Pliny one-upped other persecutors from before him and demanded that Christians also curse Jesus Christ. Like, bring down a curse on Jesus and show me that you don't serve him. It wasn't enough just to try to make a statement about Jesus or about Trajan being Lord and God because, well, maybe he's just a polytheist. Maybe the Christian can believe that both are true at the same time. But you cannot have a Christian invoke a curse on Jesus Christ and then still follow him, right? Right. That's what the early church was subjected to, which is why I think this is what Matthew means. I don't have time to get into this, but Matthew's writing his gospel in the 50s AD when Nero is already emperor, I think. And so in a short while, Nero is going to start persecuting Christians. And it seems to me that this story in particular is very helpful for people who are very much like Peter. I mean, we don't know who he called the curse down on but the damage was done as soon as that statement crossed his lips. I do not know this man. Which led to the epilogue, the painful end. What Jesus, what God had sovereignly arranged in the courtyard in verse 69, Peter is reaping the whirlwind of in verse 75. The rooster crows. The rooster crowing can just be one of two times of night. Some commentaries say that the, that the 3 a.m. changing of the guard in the Antonio Fortress was, was what's referred to here at the rooster crowing in verse 74. And, and that is because at 3 a.m., a, a trumpet by a Roman soldier was blown. The trumpet was called the Gallicinium. The Gallicinium blow was the rooster crow at 3 a.m., which signaled that the guards needed to change in the fortress. A second option for what this rooster crow might mean is that it was a literal rooster crowing pre-dawn around 5 a.m. or so at this time of year. I would lean very much toward a literal rooster crow here, putting it at about a pre-dawn time of about 5 a.m. But if you go for 3 a.m., that's fine. In Luke's account, he is calling down a curse. I do think it's on Christ. He's calling down a curse on Christ, the rooster crows, and then... Jesus, in, inside the courtroom, looks out of the door, looks all the way to the door of the courtyard and locks eyes on Peter at this exact moment. Paul, Peter has just denied Christ three times and then Jesus looks at him. And struck with the memory of Jesus' words just hours before on the way to the garden, that Peter would deny Christ three times, and Peter is saying, I will never do that. He rushes out from the courtyard, out the door, outside the city, and weeps bitterly. The term bitterly, to close the passage, only occurs in the New Testament with reference to Peter here and in Mark. Do you, do you think it's not significant that in verse 58, Peter went to see, into the courtyard to see the end? No doubt with 
what he thought was with reference to Jesus. And in the end, Peter had entered the courtyard to experience his own end. This is the last time that we see Ma a Peter in Matthew's gospel, by the way. He doesn't make another appearance. I know you want to jump to John's gospel for the restoration of Peter, but that's not Matthew's point here. Matthew doesn't do that. There's no more confessions from Peter, no more confident assertions, no more walking on water, no more, no more swashbuckling with his sword in the garden. Jesus had been unmistakably right. All of them would fall away and desert him. They did. One of them would betray him. We're going to see that this next Sunday. And one of them would deny him three times. And he just did. Jesus was absolutely right And the curtain closes with Peter weeping bitterly. I wonder why Matthew did this. Why doesn't he share the story of Peter's restoration? I mean, it makes for a happy ending. Why not? I think it's to show that in the end, every, everyone fails. Everyone fails, including you and me. I, I think that's the point except for one, so that the one alone will die for the ones who fail, like you and me. Can I say it like this? Aren't you glad, therefore, that Peter did fail? And for the one who thinks he in this room stands, shouldn't you take heed lest you like him fall too? John Calvin says, speaking of Peter, however lame our repentance, yet we may have good hope. He does get into how Jesus earlier in the last night of his life said, I'm going to be raised from the dead, and I'm going to go meet you in Galilee. There is a promise that Peter will be restored, even in Matthew. And so Calvin says, however lame our repentance, yet we may have good hope. As long as it is sincere, God scorns not even feeble repentance. Repentance that comes after being badly damaged by our sin. God will still take us back. Isaac Williams says this, we may humbly venture to think that this melancholy failure in one so eminent and favored as Peter was permitted to occur to afford us encouragement and hope in similar derelictions and temptations. And that as our Lord could not afford us an instance of human infirmity in himself, he has given it to us in the person of the most exalted of his pastors. Why? So that all may hear that any of us can fall so that none of us may presume upon our own strength and all of us because of Peter can have hope because if Peter can see him and then be commissioned by him at the end of Matthew after this disaster then I'm, gonna, I'm just going to hazard a parallel guess that whatever your disaster is, even feeble restoration can restore you and recommission you to serve the master. So take hope. Feebly repent. And like Peter, turn back to Jesus. Father, we thank you for this text. It is a hard one. We, we still want to jump outside of it to, to put a bow on it, but that's not what Matthew wants us to do. So Lord, if there is someone in this room who is grossly denying Jesus, maybe in the workplace, maybe at school, God, I pray that you would break them even now and, and just to help them to feebly turn back to you. 
Lord, if there is one of us who is on autopilot in life and, and assuming that, that we have the strength in ourselves to stand firm in the faith because we've been doing this for years or, or, or we have a lot of experience in ministry so we don't need to lean on you anymore or we, we've seen you do great things in our lives so we don't need to lean on you anymore. We can just go on autopilot in ministry. Oh God, please let us never presume upon our past strengths or our present victories. God, please drive us back to Christ and cause us to fall before him again with fresh faith and dependence, asking for him to help us stand firm. Thank you for Peter being so humble to help Matthew get this in this gospel to help Mark record it in his gospel, to help Luke record it in his gospel, and to make sure that John had enough information to put it in his gospel years later. Four times, Peter insisted that this was put in these gospel accounts so that we might have hope that if you could restore him with this, then you can restore us too. So draw us near to you, Lord, and away from the damage we are doing to ourselves. We pray in Christ's name, amen.